we have an art painting with great historic and sentimental value. This art piece was made by George Clausen, who was one of the most beautiful artists in Britain. To the guest, this piece has tremendous charisma. It is the most compulsive object in my house. Yes. And it's in my living room and people comment on it. It, it has a lot of humor, a lot of compassion. This painting dates back to 1917, during the First World War. George Clausen is also the same artist responsible for youthful sorrows painting. One of the most compelling things about this painting is her eyes. These eyes have had the cream of youth dying in her arms. Yes. And these eyes reflect something within her which she will live with for the rest of her life, as most people who survived the First World War did. Yes. A popular George Clausen painting can make half a million pounds, but this piece is valued at I would value this at 20 to 30,000 pounds, yes. that sort of level. Yes. And I think it's a, a wonderful treasure. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Belonging to the guest's mother-in-law, this vase has been in the family for 35 years. This is a work by Charlie Baldwin, who loved to paint swans. During his career, he painted hundreds of vases, but usually with swans flying around the vase. But in this, the swans are swimming, which makes this vase even more unique. To see what date they were painted, they have a mark on the bottom for the factory year code. Uh, the um, year, year mark, a little dots around the Worcester factory mark, and here this one's got eight dots. That makes it 1899. 1899. And, and that is, um, that makes sense because that's quite early for this decoration. The swans are more real, but they look more fluffy, typical of the early work of Charlie Baldwin. We can also see a signature here, neatly painted C. Baldwin. The modeling of the handles was done by James Hadley. It was a new light, airy style of decoration that became enormously popular. This item was valued at 15,000 to 20,000 pounds. Oh, really? Gosh, you'll be happy with that. That's great. This is a really lovely thing. Let's hear the guests tell us about the origin. It's been in the family for a generation, and um, about 30 years ago, my, my father gave me as a wedding present. It is actually made of hundreds of thousands of tiny little pieces of glass, which is called micro mosaic. A closer look reveals that the technique used for this was revived in Rome at the beginning of the 18th century. Even if the image gets a bit dirty, you can easily clean it off and still retain the delightful image. Looking classical lady yes. holding um, a garland of flowers um, and is thoroughly attractive. On removing the back cover, we see the backboard is made of timber. The back plate is made of metal, Japan, and iron. It's a really beautiful object and is worth? Probably cover it for about £12,000. Unbelievable. Books are precious pieces of history. One such remarkable find was discovered by the guest at the bottom of a box lot. An old baseball book containing signatures from the 1939-9040 baseball era. Purchased at an auction for just $10 only, the guest patiently awaited its appearance, hoping to uncover hidden treasures. This box turned out to be the 1939 Who's Who in the Major Leagues, and it held within its pages a treasure trove of autographs from legendary players of the time. Notably, the guest found signatures from iconic figures like Lou Gehrig, Joe DiMaggio and a rookie Ted Williams. With approximately 184 signatures in total, this book is an extraordinary discovery. I'm not aware of a baseball publication from this era that has as many signatures as this book. And it reflects the rich history of baseball and its celebrated players. The appraiser valued this remarkable find at a whopping $10,000 to $15,000. Fantastic. It will, it will go to the kids because they're baseball fans also, but nice. Had no idea. You've got a century-old double-decker bus here. It's a clockwork toy still in excellent condition. The appraisal had guessed it was made around 1912, and the guest had revealed how he got to her. It's an example of one of Germany's popular buses used to convey passengers. It has a spiral steer, and unlike many of its type, this particular one still has its driver, and that has made it of higher value than others. Collector of toys will love to jump on it because of its good condition. The piece can be valued around 800 to 1,200 pounds. Pays for the trip to the UK. <laughs> this man brought a quirky sideboard, he inherited it from his aunt, and it looks magical and mysterious. It is an unconventional piece of furniture, and one of the differentials are the materials. 
and has an amazing hinge side showing different woods combined for one furniture. Finally, the handles are Victorian-era designs. It's worth about 100 pounds at auction. Sure, yeah, that's great, thank you. Today, the guests brought along a glass star inscribed with the phrase, May the Force be with you. It's connected to the Star Wars, the franchise. It is a prospect star together with two Christmas cards, an invitation to a special screening of Empire Strikes Back in May 1981. The guests recount how these came into his possession. No, not at all, but my mother was indirectly involved with one of the producers. I that see. sounds not good, does it? <laughs> The star was given out to the crew and cast as a sort of souvenir, looking at the Christmas cards. And actually, the Christmas cards are interesting to me because you've got little signatures on the bottom there, RMQ, which oh. is Ralph Macquarie. So Ralph Macquarie is so critical to the entire visual impact of the Star Wars saga. He devised many of the characters. These items are not in the best condition, though, with a chip on the star. The appraiser values these items at? Say, 1,500, maybe even 2,000 really? pounds. Really? That's astonishing. It was quite easy for the appraisal to identify that the art here belongs to Charles Pears, a British artist, painter, and illustrator who is known for his attention to detail on sea paintings. The sea paint here has a cross hatching of grey on green and blue. The paint shows a French bark backing off, having discovered a beachy head in fog. The owner of the painting shares a little detail on how he got to own the piece of art. It uh, was purchased by my father at an exhibition in 1937. The style of painting is such that it creates a lumpy sea where anyone offshore will only aim to see the lighthouse afar off. The work is far beyond ordinary art and can be valued around. Today it's, it's worth an auction in the region of around eight to 12,000 pounds. It's a lot more than I thought it was. <laughs> The guest brings this map, which he produced at an auction house, seeking knowledge on its age, authenticity, and value. This map is over 450 years old, dating to 1575. It is an extract of the book Civitates Orbis Terrarium, meaning Cities of the World. This is, as you know, Cambridge. And you can see this is what the Elizabethan uh, English were wearing at the time. Not only is it that old, but the color is that old. There's significant damage by mold to the map. This affects its existence and value. The appraiser values it to be about. Now, in terms of the value as it is, you could sell this in a retail shop for about $1,800. Very good. This person acquired these two Chinese glass bottle vases in an interesting manner. He went to an auction for fun with his brother-in-law. So I just rode over with him, had no intention of buying anything, and they brought out these jars, and, and I wasn't even listening, really, to what they were talking about, but... He raised his hand out of curiosity and ended up becoming the owner of these vases. His brother-in-law believed he lost $200 on two ordinary jars. His handmade glass vases are dark blue, thick and of high quality, and in good shape. It's really unusual to find a pair. A pair. So that's good. <laughs> these glasses were made in China around 1775. The four Chinese characters on this square indicate they were made during the Quanlong Emperor's reign. Chips on the bottom and top decrease their value, but these chips can't affect much the stability and integrity of these ancient vases. Yes. But so I would say at auction, right. these would sell for $4,000 to $6,000. Wow. This is the first book printed in England with movable parts. In the year 1476, Geoffrey Chaucer, who was working in Bruges at the time, moved his printing press uh, to London, to Westminster, to within the precincts of Westminster Abbey. And there he set up a press and he printed the first book printed in England with movable type. This book is the most important piece of Middle English literature ever written, and it was the Canterbury Tales. Now, this is not the first edition. This is not the 1476 edition is from 1560, which makes it the fifth edition of the works of Chaucer. And if we turn to the Knight's Tale, which is number one, we have the most gorgeous woodcut illustration there. And we have this wonderful black letter, which typifies the printing of this period, and also wonderful paper too. Now the binding again is remarkable. It's lacking its class here, which is understandable because these often did wear off. Of a very fine, uh, blind-stamped calf. The guest got this from a friend. His aunt died about six months ago, and uh, the age of about 80. It's absolutely wonderful and in value. It would be worth about? 
I estimate this not to be £850,000, but about 8500 Yes, It's a wonderful book, and thank you so much for bringing it in. Thank you very much for explaining to us. It's superb. Another great piece to look at in this episode is the Signal Cannon, made by the Winchester Repeating Arms Company, an American company that specializes in the production of repeating arms and ammunition. The piece belongs to the guest's grandfather, and as small as it is, its sound can deafen the ear. The guest shares a rare and almost unbelievable information about the sound effect of the cannon. They made about 18,000 of them in total, and they would generally be used for salute cannons, the beginning of races. It's a single cannon filled from the rare. It requires only a standard 10-gauge blank shotgun shell. Balls and regular shotguns are not allowed to be used in it. The breech behind it serves as its cover, which is closed after a blank shotgun shell has been inserted into it. When the breech has been closed, a cord by its side is pulled to snap the firing pin into the cannon to get it fired. The piece is one of the 18,000 made by the company in 1898. The products were used for salute at the beginning of races to make a loud sound. It's a nice gem to have it as it serves many purposes. And market value, it's worth? This condition, I would estimate at auction, it would bring around six to eight hundred dollars. Oh, wow, that's very nice. Yeah. This is a work of young Albert Binns from 1881. It is tragic that the artist made this piece at 16 and died the following year. The painting is the Doji's dinner carved on a dish. The art was crafted in a very usual technique. It was scratched in with a sharp tool when the clay used in making the dish was still wet. It's one of the usual pieces of royal Worcester porcelain, as many of it are not made available to the public because of the tragedy attached to it. The artist was a son of the Worcester factory, but he didn't live long enough to live his career as an artist. They guessed he got it from her mother, but it belonged to her grandmother, who bought it in 1882. I got that from my mother, but she got it from her mother. The dish is worth about... A thousand pounds. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Take a long look at this wonderful, colorful jewel. According to the guest, it was acquired by her grandparents. My grandfather was a well-known goldsmith and silversmith in the early part of this century. Um, I think that's older. Uh, he obviously simply acquired it, I imagine, because he fell in love with it. It's a stunning example of Victorian jewelry at its absolute best. And it's a type of jewelry that's often called Holbein-esque. There was a fashion throughout England in the 1860s to emulate the Elizabethan age. It's a more precise way. It's based on a well-known jewel called the Grizzle Jewel, made using a Renaissance technique where the gold is engraved. engraved and then it's flooded with these viv very vivid colors, mm -hmm. and it's something that one would expect to see on English Renaissance jewelry. It also has Tudor roses at the back in vivid red and green Champlave enamel. Still in pristine condition, this jewel is valued at? One could expect to pay 8,000 pounds for it if somebody was mm -hmm. really greedy, perhaps 10,000 yes. for such a dazzling example. Gosh. Thanks nice to know. Me. It's a pleasure. Thank you for Wonderful. looking at it. The guitar is so priceless to the guests that he went to remarkable lengths to get it back when it was stolen. The guitar was purchased in 1964 with the sum of $300. The 1964 Jazz Master, which was made by the company Fender, has a matching body and headstock. The earlier custom color Fenders would just have the custom color on the body, but the, but the headstock would be the blonde maple. Oh. Despite the chips on his body, the guitar is in pretty good shape. Together with the amplifiers, the appraiser values it about. So the amplifier is probably easier at the $3,000, $3,500, something like that. Will the guest sell it? Take a close look at these items on display. These ones are plate buckets. That accounts for the fact that, that, that it has a gap so that you can lift the plates in and out. And they were carried from the kitchen to the dining room. Yes. In pairs. This is a nice sized one, probably for dessert plates rather than dinner plates. It's a particularly pretty little brass mount around here, which is sort of 1810 to 1815. They did, however, go out of fashion in 1830. They're incredibly unique and are priced at about six and eight thousand pounds, depending on really? their size and quality. 1811 is such a year ago, but these original sculptural objects from the year still remain beautiful and in great shape. The sculptural piece is made by England's most celebrated silversmith, Paul Storr. He was famous in the early to mid-19th century until date. His legacy, as seen in the pieces brought by the guest, lives on. The pieces are some of its rare products, which are often silver. 
These are gold pieces with an amazing history attached to them. The production year of the items ranges from 1811 to 1813. The order of the day in these years had an impact on what Paul made. The items from 1811 have the letter Q inscribed in them, while those from 1913 have the letter S. The letter distinguishes the items and make it easy to know its year of production. Paul's work travels beyond these years. He was active in his craft, also motivated by history. One of the sculpture has an identical design to the famous Salt Salier sculpture made by St. Francis by Benevento Cellini. One could also assume that Paul was inspired by these sauce boats and salt cellar sculpture made by Nicholas Sprintmont, which he saw at Windsor Castle when working by King George III. These pieces remain in great shape, and we can say the guest got a great piece from his father. It's really tough to put a price on pieces that are great, clean, and golden as these, but the appraiser had to agree to a soothing price, which the owner wasn't expecting. The pieces are said to be worth up to. I think I'd have to be looking at £40,000. Good luck. <laughs> you do surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> this group of medals once belonged to one of the few from the Battle of Britain. The guest gives us a little insight on the owner of these items. He was my grandfather, Billy. My mother recently passed away, and these were her most cherished possessions. The appraiser reveals some details about the medal as well. This little clasp here. It's a humble little thing given out to just over two and a half thousand men. And your granddad was a wireless operator, air gunner, but also a radar operator. The first item is a cigarette case. Then we have two little caterpillars, which are for airmen whose lives were saved by a parachute. The caterpillar club is called so because caterpillars make silk. The parachutes were made of silk. And the club motto is life hangs by a silken thread. There's also a goldfish club membership card because he came down in the sea and his life was saved by a dinghy. The logbooks contain over 100 operational missions. This is a spectacular collection. In the current market, they're worth? They're worth £100,000. I wasn't expecting that. This little box of treasures makes its way to the show. It belonged to the guest's grandfather. It dates to the 1820s, 1830s. The miniature chest is primarily made of tiger maple, indicating it was probably made in New England. So the secondary woods are, are white pine and what looks like basswood. You find that in Vermont and sort of northern New England. This little gem is a notable collector's piece. If you're collecting chests of drawers, you can only fit so many into your room or in the house. But I've seen collectors who will take these little things. It's valued at? I think at auction, I could see this estimated at six to 8000 Oh my God. Wow. And in 2019, the value fell to between $2,500 and $3,500. What do you think the value will be today? Let us know in the comments section. This is called a capacet, which is a probable Spanish origin. It's acquired through an exchange between acquaintances. Well, it came into the family. We had a little swap. We did a part exchange with someone who was interested in a chest that we had. And so the chest went. And the chest went. And, and you we, got this. Yeah. This piece is really early and is not usually as tall. With ties to the Spanish Armada in 1588, and people interested in that period would love it. It's not a pristine condition, but for something so rare, it wouldn't really matter. However, it is valued for... A collector would say, you certainly have to pay about £500 for it. So it's, I don't know, going back to the chest, <laughs> I think you are a good thing, don't you think? Oh, I think so, yes. Right, yeah. good. A symbol of our beloved country makes its way to the show. The carved wooden American eagle was inherited by the guests from his mother. The eagle, which dates to the 1850s, is carved out of soft wood. The origin is American, probably done by a carver in the Northeast. The piece is expertly made. The unusual thing about it is that when this is up high, you wouldn't see the top of the wings. Didn't stop the carver from carving them as well. Despite its damages, it is still in pretty good shape. Probably. But if you look carefully, you can see vestiges of the original gilding and gesso. Yeah. The appraiser values it about... I think for auction purposes, I would estimate its value certainly between six and eight thousand dollars. It's a splendid bird. It's me. It's it's worth a hundred thousand dollars. Really. That's right. Well, but, you know, there's no price for sentiment. It's not going any place now. This exquisite piece of art is made by the French potter Bernard Palissy. Meticulously crafted, this piece highlights the fine intricacies of aquatic life, infusing a hint of the sea into your dining experience. This piece is a collection of the guest grandparents. And we got to choose something of theirs to remember them by. I thought, well, I associate them with the fish plate more than anything else. 
The vibrant colors and lifelike textures bring a whimsical and elegant touch to your living room. These pieces were produced not only in France, but also in England, Germany, and Portugal. This piece falls under the category of Majolica, known for its beautiful glazes. Palissy expertly molds and paints an enchanting assortment of fish, shells, and vegetation. At appraisal, the value would be between... The right auction, it would realize in the range of, of $2,500 to $3,500. Wow! These are Jazz Fest posters. The guests have been collecting these since 1976. This is what the appraiser has to say about the Jazz Fest. Extraordinary event. I mean, to call it a festival is an understatement. It's 12 different stages, music from all over the world, great food, arts and crafts, everything going on. And the festival began in 1970. These are the three official posters from Jazz Fest from 1976, then 1979, and 99. The center poster has a uniqueness about it. A thousand of them were printed signed and numbered, and a thousand were printed unsigned, and they were sold at different prices. You have one that is signed by the artist Maria Laredo mm -hmm. and numbered 483. The poster from 1979, 1,000 copies were signed and numbered, with this one signed by John Martinez, numbered 494. But the unsigned edition was up to 10,000. The 1999 version features the unparalleled Professor Longhair, Henry Roland Bird, who was a pianist. It was signed by the artist George Valentin Duro and numbered 3,000. What do you think the value of these pieces might be? Well, the Professor Longhair poster goes for... So when these come up for auction, they tend to sell for between $400 and $600. Then we come to the John Martinez, which sells for... You could expect it to sell for $700 to $1,000. As for the one in the middle, at auction it costs. I would estimate it between $4,000 and $6,000. <laughs> These pieces of jewelry have a merge of Russian and English royalties. It was purchased by Princess Alex of Hesse and was gifted to the landlady of the boarding house. She stayed in Horrogate after the latter gave birth to twins, and she was considered as the twins' godmother. The gift contains cufflinks and nappy pins, all bought in Horgate. She also sent gifts to the family after she returned to Russia. This gold cross was sent to the male twin on his 21st birthday. The piece was brought back to life after the end of the Russian royal family by the son of the male twin. It's a great piece that's well cherished by the English family. This man brought an Albrechet Durer and Rembrandt print and a portrait. He inherited all of them from his father. The first one is an Albrecht Durer, earliest work believed to be made in 1514. The one in the center is a beautiful drawing by Rembrandt dating to 1647. While the last print is a portrait of Jean Lepma dated to the late 18th century. The Durer is valued at $40,000, while the Rembrandt at $50,000. The last print is valued at $5,000. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm astonished. No, I'm amazed. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have this extraordinary wassail bowl, which is made of one of dense timbers called lignum vitae. It really is a stunning piece, one of the largest ever seen. This is what the appraiser had to say about it. Maybe a tad bigger, but if not, certainly the same size in the Victorian Albert Museum, really? which has a crisscross pattern cut onto it and the original fitments to go in those yes. little holes. And those were little cups with a spike on. This was made in 1640, which was really early. When asked where it was kept, the guest said, It's by Sir Robert Walpole's desk in the library. Um, it doesn't have any purpose. <laughs> it sits there. <laughs> Don't sort of throw anything wondered, into this. Eh? No, well, I suppose <laughs> with a lid. Such an interesting piece in the market today, its value would be... £5,000. Really? Yes. Right. With its unique grass seat, this chair combines both comfort and aesthetic appeal. The chair was bought by the guest in 1986 for $23. Made by the renowned furniture designer George Nakashima, this chair showcases his signature style of blending traditional Japanese woodworking techniques with modern elements. The chair's distinctive feature lies in its grass seat, a unique fusion of organic and industrial elements. And what this chair is, is it's a very elegant, sophisticated, modern version of a traditional Japanese crafted chair. The handcrafted, tightly woven seagrass seats, hand-shaped side rail spindles, and hand-turned legs all indicate that it is authentic Nakashima furniture. This beautiful piece goes for... This chair at auction typically sells for between $2,000 and $2,500. Okay. Uh, Thank you so much. 
We have a Rolex Sea Dweller watch meant for professional divers. It belongs to our guest, who quite ironically isn't a sea diver. I'm aware that Rolex made the best watches. My brother-in-law, who's now passed away, had a Submariner, and he said if you're going to buy one, buy the Sea Dweller. It was bought brand new in January 82, and is the iconic 1665. This piece is truly unique. This one is the last of the series of what we refer to, what collectors refer to, as the Great White. This is because it has the writing in white rather than red. It's got a very small helium escape valve, which lets out the helium gas as the divers decompress. When asked about the scratch in the glass, the guest said, I was out cycling with my daughter and I was going downhill yeah. too fast. Came off and it caught on the gravel. I ended up in the hospital for a week with a punctured lung. <laughs> this is the full set with the bill of sale included. This piece would be valued at eighteen to twenty thousand dollars. Fail. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> Here we have the replica of the Royal Albert Bridge. When asked about the origin, the guest said, "Where did it come from?" I believe it came from um, a gentleman who was uh, an apprentice in the dockyard back in the 1850s. Right. It's been handed down in the family for generations now. The bridge was completed or opened in 1859. It was designed by Brunel, and it was opened just when he was dying. It was the first physical link between Cornwall and England. The bridge is just such an exciting thing to see. At auctions, this replica would go for... £3,000, I'll for it. Just that. Old-time pieces of modern-day beauty are what we should call these Chinese porcelain pots. Before this time, the guests had come in contact with the piece about 35 years ago. Wow. The owner got the piece from a lady who was her husband's relation, and she loves it. You may think it's just a pot, but I think otherwise. This pot is imperial Chinese porcelain, specially made for the imperial court. It's a representation of 18th century Chinese classicalism. It's called an ho, and as you can see, it is painted in underglazed cobalt blue. The design on it is quite traditional. You can see the lotus around its neck, Buddhist designs, and Banti motif around its belly. The alien snot design is closely associated with Buddha, and it's also got another, which is the twin fish, signaling marital harmony. Now you know it isn't just a regular pot. So many details, so many cultures and practices of the East well painted on a pot that makes it really unique. The pot's still got more specialties. It's got the rain mark and seal mark of the Emperor Qin El. This particular pot brought to the show isn't the most perfect of its type. It's got a broken sprout, and that may have reduced its worth from tens of thousands to a price around. They will probably pay maybe five or ten thousand pounds for a repaired piece. That's what this is worth, somewhere between five and ten thousand pounds. The appraiser had called these items a cabinet of curiosities. This means they were a very special set of pieces that'll arrest your interest. It's interesting to know that it was passed down to the guest from her late grandmother. Let us dive into the box and erase the curiosities. The items are Georgian and Victorian jewelries. This eye-catching chain is a Georgian gold Betcha Link chain. It's got a hand with a gem set ring at the bottom of making in its rare design. The other chain is made of spurn gold, which was probably made around 1825 and 1830. Box is full of more pieces of jewelry. We've got mourning rings used to mourn the death of a loved one. Usually the name of the late individual is engraved behind the ring. This is a late Victorian ring with sapphire surrounded by half pearls. We've got more curiosity to clear. It's good to know what the items are worth. Listen to the valuation as called by the appraiser. From what looks like a fairly sort of um, straight Sheffield plate set, which is worth uh, maybe no more than around about £300, you've got a lower tier drawer, which is probably worth £8,000. Door. <laughs> oh, I didn't realise that at all. The item you see here is the Heatley penicillin vessel from the Second World War. One of the world's first penicillin was manufactured in this vessel. It was made by Professor Norman Healy. I was at Oxford University. He, he had a connection with, with my school, with our school, where I'm headmaster. And uh, I've got two sixth formers here who are science students, and they helped to transport the old relic down today. This is what the appraiser has to say about the item. And, and, and a lot of the research that was done, they tried jam jars, they tried cooking pots. They actually tried bedpans, which is where I think he got the inspiration from this. And this actually worked out perfectly for the production of penicillin. Knowing that without this, a lot of lives would have been lost, given it an unimaginable value. Without Healy and this vessel, penicillin might have as well never been produced. Here's an amazing fact about this item. The thing is that it was, it was kind of lost for a while on a shelf um, in my study. And 
I was reading that book on Norman Heatley, and I, I saw a photograph, and I thought, we've got one of those. And yeah. um, They're also quite delicate. Its historical link to the school, and currently at auctions, holds a value of? fifteen to 25000 Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Take a good look at the 18 karat gold bracelet with an English hallmark on it. The diamonds around are Swiss diamonds, also called eight cuts diamonds. They belong to the guest grandmother. Father was on the Queen Mary when it first sailed, and the American woman was looking over the top, and her jewelry box fell down the side, and he had to climb over the side. He could have been killed, and he managed to salvage the jewelry box, and she gave him that in appreciation. It's an exceptional watch with an amazing story to it. To go into a store and try to replace one of these would be really hard, and at auction it would sell for? It's going to cost you best part three or four thousand pounds. Yes. Thanks for bringing it along. Thank you. Thank you. This guest brought a mountain landscape painting that was collected by her husband. Albert Burstadt is the artist who was originally born in Germany before coming to America. He was fascinated by the landscapes of different countries for his painting. His work is believed to be made in 1875. His works are a blend of Western, European, and American landscapes. This particular work features mountains like the Alps or Rocky Mountains. This painting is worth $50,000. Oh, really? I, I mean, really? Yes. <laughs> I, I had no idea. He's really one of the hottest artists in the traditional American paintings market. Wonderful. This guest brings two ceramic pots, which have been in her husband's family for some time. These pots belong to the Anazazi tribe. The Anazazi were a Native American Pueblo tribe who lived in the Four Corners, where the states Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, and Arizona meet. They were famous for the kind of buildings they had. These vessels were uniquely made of clay and ash. And then they would make it into long strips, and they were coiled like this. Oh, wow. And while it was still wet or in the leather condition, they would scrape it till it was really, really thin. It's quite rare to be seen in this intact condition. So much of this archaeological material it comes in fragments and the pieces oh, yeah. are put together and things. So this is really quite wonderful. How much will the appraiser value it? I would probably put an insurance value of about 6000 on the two. Oh, wonderful. This Cubist painting challenges traditional forms and perspectives of art. The guest received the painting in 1967 from the artist George Melly. Melly, a native of Liverpool, was a painter, writer, critic and lecturer. And um, he was very familiar with the Palmer House when he was growing up. And he was totally involved with our campaign to restore this wonderful Palm House. The painting, which is a cubist picture of the outside of the Sefton Park Palm House, showcases the unique and creative sense of Melly. All the different influences. You've got cubism, you've got collage here. You look down here, you've got collage down here with the flowers. So you've got a mixture of sort of cubism and almost pop art like Peter Blake. The appraiser values this painting between? And I think it would make somewhere in the region of between 1,500 and 2,500 pounds. Well, I think that's, that's lovely and very nice to know. Take a look at this ceramic portrait of Queen Anne, an elegant piece with an interesting story of its origin. I have always suspected that she was Queen Anne. And so my father told me she always was suspended from the same place on the wall. And uh, latterly, she's hung from a, um, a picture hook in our house. According to the appraiser, it has another copy that was auctioned in London and dated 1704. This piece is really interesting in having this lovely squirrely border with foliage reserved on it. The portrait was probably taken from an engraving after a painting by Nella, or one of the major artists of the time. Here's what the appraiser thinks about this. This is part of a group of, of plaques that all have similar marks to this, which is probably the monogram of the painter. We don't know who he is, but he did do several plaques, some of which are dated around this period. With minor damages, how much do you think this piece would fetch? Fetch £14,000 to give you some idea of what this should be worth today. Well, all I can say is that I'm very relieved that uh, we had such a strong nail in the wall. <laughs> Have you seen such a piece of elegant costume jewelry before? When asked about it, the guest said, It was a combination. It's color, it's simplicity, it's really bold, and it just, it really just appealed. It was actually in a kind of dark corner, and I really just loved it straight away. She got it from a little antique shop in an alleyway in Australia. It doesn't have a marker mark, but it is really high quality costume jewelry. 
Because costume jewellery comes in all sorts of levels. I mean, there's very cheap costume jewellery, there's extremely expensive costume jewellery, and this is just incredibly well made. It's beautifully designed, it might be a French origin. It makes me think it was made for a couture collection. <laughs> and you just don't get this detail on every piece of costume jewellery. It was definitely made in the 1950s. In today's market, this jewellery would go for... Four to five hundred pounds. Oh my goodness. <laughs> the guests who brought this intriguing piece of artwork to a museum. The Real Martin China Clay Museum near St. Austell. This painting was commissioned by Henry Rockingham Gill. It was painted by a local artist, Elliot of Nuki, in 1892. The scene is a china clay pit, as it would have appeared in the late 19th century. This is what the appraiser has to say about the painting. I looked up Elliot, and uh, he exhibited a number of pictures in the Royal Academy. They all seem to be uh, views which are, are very majestic, command a, a, a grand prospect. It's in remarkably good condition, and the colors have lasted well. At auction, its value would be... Thing in the region of £3,000 would just about cover it. <laughs> yes. well, Thank you very much. It's about right. The guest inherited the junior kerosene lamp from his parents, which held childhood memories. The lamp had Burmese glass from a company in England named Webb. Frederick Shirley of Mount Washington Glass invented Burmese glass in the United States. This item had a berry and leaf pattern made by Frederick Shirley, dated back to 1886. The lamp was umbrella-shaped and in pristine condition. The color shade transitioned from salmon pink to lemon yellow, adding aesthetic appeal. We're very fortunate to have an umbrella-shaped shade in perfect condition. The base had the web circular mark, and fixtures indicated that it was made in Germany and tended to be exported to London. How much would the item be valued? In today's market, at auction, mm -hmm. I would say four to 5000 for this lamp. Oh my gosh. From the collection of arms and armor of his father, this man brought an articulated iron lobster made by the Mayuchin family, originally armorers in Japan. In the mid-19th century, they transitioned to crafting tourist objects like this lobster due to the collapse of the feudal system. The Iron Lobster has a detailed and naturalistic replica of a live lobster, complete with artificial coloring to enhance its lifelike appearance. The appraiser mentioned selling a similar item, a dragon, for $10,000. But with the lobster's fine quality, it's definitely worth more than that. I would say a conservative price on this one would be $15,000. Oh, great. This Olaf Carl Seltzer oil painting and personal letter were brought to the show by a guest who received them courtesy of her great aunt. Olaf Carl Seltzer was a Scandinavian artist who, over his fledgling career, dedicated his paintings to illustrating life in the American West. This piece depicts a cowboy enjoying a smoke with his trusted horse right beside him. The demand for this Western piece is at an all-time high right now. The cowboy painting would be worth around fifteen to twenty thousand dollars, while the letter would be valued at around two to three thousand dollars. Great. Thank you so much. Oh, no, well, thank you. We have interesting pieces of furniture with an incredible story to follow. Owned by Moses Annenberg, who is a publishing mogul in Philadelphia. This furniture was made by an up-and-coming furniture designer called Thomas Molesworth. Eventually, it came up for a sheriff's auction and was bought by the guest stepfather. The furniture was from, like, the 1930s, and my folks bought it probably in the late 50s. Thomas Molesworth is one of the best furniture makers in the 20th century. One unique feature of his work is the burling and the wood. Most of the wood that Molesworth used was Douglas fir, found in Wyoming, South Dakota, and Montana. Let's take a look at the individual furniture. So on the little table, first of all, I love the mining motif on top. I love the pick, the shovel, and the, and the gold pan. It's so Molesworth. The top of the table is made out of leather, dyed green leather. This collection had approximately 250 pieces in it, the guest possessing about 40 pieces of it. When it comes to the value of this incredible collection, this is what the appraiser has to say. But I would guess the couch to be worth at auction about forty to fifty thousand dollars. With the chair costing forty thousand dollars and the table fifteen thousand dollars. I love those numbers. <laughs> <And> <laughs> sure you, you do. This woman brought this mahogany carved cellaret to the show. This particular cellaret was produced by English cabinet makers for the masters of such luxury items. The incredible things that differentiate this cellaret are the two foxes on both sides and other beautiful specific details like gilt bronze handles and motifs. 
Also, the interior of this piece is lined with zinc or lead, making it a timeless and lucrative piece. This cellarette would be worth around eight to twelve thousand dollars. Saying I don't care what I have to pay, I gotta own it. This guest brought in Alphonse Walde oil painting created in 1935, which he thought it was just a tourist souvenir. So finding out its value was a shock. The painting is a joy to look at. Apparently, it's one of the art's appraisers' dream of what we came here for. You know, this is what we dream of. And significantly valuable. The value is worth between two hundred and three hundred thousand dollars. Oh, oh, that's terrible. <laughs> oh, it was such a nice picture to just sort of have around. This is a really distinctive clock. It is a really rare RAF sector clock, also known as a color change clock. This is how it works. And this is where the sector clock comes in. Wherever the plot is first seen, it's timed. And wherever the minute hand is, in this case, it's on the purple, that becomes a purple plot at whatever the time is. The pretty thing about the sector clock is... That goes down as purple plot, time, whatever the time is. So you can always track where the plots are. It was part of the system called ground controlled interception. It was used till the Cold War when computer systems took over. When asked how he acquired it, this is what the guest has to say. My employers in 1973 uh, were clearing offices and they auctioned off all these surplus items in that building. As of then, it was got at auction for 25 pounds, but its current market price is 4,000 pounds. That's fabulous. That's <laughs> great. <laughs> Our watch experts often get to see some amazing timepieces on the roadshow. The watch is known as the Moon Watch because it was worn by Armstrong in 1969. This guest also brought the same brand, Omega Speedmaster watch, which is famous as the Moon Watch. The watch is in poor condition. And how did it get into this state? It, unfortunately, went through my lawnmower. It was purchased secondhand in the mid-1960s. Among the three types, pre-space, pre-moon, and post-moon, it belongs to the pre-space era. And the pre-space era extends up to 1960. Despite its rusty condition, it's extraordinary that it has survived over the years. Its strap looks good and suitable for it. The value of the strap alone is 3,000 pounds. The estimated value for the watch is 18 to 20,000 pounds. My son will be even more excited because he wants to inherit it. The guest shared an amazing story about this here. It was gifted to her family by one of their workers who assisted them in running a seafood business. The piece was made by James Bittman, an English painter who specializes in agricultural and rural painting. The piece is called the Lobster Sauce, and it's got a root from Germany. The strange, cruel-looking animal picture was influenced by the painting of Edwin Lancia. It's a great work of imagination, portraying a fierce battle between a terrified cat and a fish. I'll say it's one-of-a-kind art different from other forms of the usual paintings you see around. It's a great paint that a whopping amount between. I would say between four and five thousand pounds. I better tell him. <laughs> the guest showcased a piece of artwork acquired by her father in law upon retiring from Nabisco Foods as a gift. The artwork, created by Andy Warhol in 1984, featured Canadian ice hockey player Wayne Gretzky in Warhol's distinctive pop art style. This depiction emphasized the athlete's status as both a celebrity and a sports legend. Andy Warhol is renowned for his portraits of celebrities, and this piece exemplified his skill in capturing iconic figures. The appraiser highlighted that the artwork was a screen print with limited edition and was signed by both Warhol and Gretzky, further enhancing its value. The estimated value ranged between seven to $10,000. Terrific, excellent, great, well, thank you. At first glance, this rope looks like any other, but there's more to it than meets the eye. It's made from cow hides maybe even four of them. People took a lot of time and effort to make it. They cut strips all around the edges and then braid them together into a strong rope. This wasn't easy. It took a lot of work. To make it last longer, they rubbed it with something called tallow. That's why it's still in good shape today. And most importantly, its price ranges from four to $6,000.